the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star, later known as the F-80, was the first operational jet fighter utilized by the United States Army Air Forces. During World War II, they were indeed America's first successful turbojet-powered combat aircraft, and while they did not see combat during World War II, they did wind up seeing it during the Korean War. The Shooting Stars have a bit of a unique look about them, since they combine modern attributes that you see in jet fighters with World War II-style aircraft. They are very much a transitionary platform. They had a crew of one, a length of 34 feet 5 inches, a wingspan of 38 feet 9 inches, a height of 11 feet 3 inches, a gross weight of 12,200 pounds, and they were powered by a single Allison J33A35 centrifugal compressor turbojet, capable of delivering 4,600 pounds of force dry, but with water injection that could be bumped up to 5,400 pounds of force. They had a maximum speed of 594 miles per hour at sea level, and had a service ceiling of 46,800 feet. They were armed with six 50 cal M3 Browning machine guns. They could also be equipped with eight 127 millimeter HVAR unguided rockets or two 1,000 pound bombs. A unique for the time attribute about them was that they were the first operational jet fighter to have their engines buried in the fuselage. Other early jets, like the ME262 and Gloucester Meteor, didn't do this but it would set the stage for how many future jets would be designed. Lockheed had been the first American aircraft company to mess about with jets, working on their L-133 in 1939, which I discussed last week. But that aircraft was rejected because it was way too advanced. Developing it would have taken too long, and the Army Air Force was looking for planes that they could get a hold of, like, right now? Not in five years. But it wasn't that they weren't interested in jets. They went with a different design from a different company, the Bell P-59 era Comet, which first flew in October of 1942. But that aircraft did not perform very well at all. It was only slightly better than piston engine fighters. And though Bell tinkered around with it to try to improve things, they became swamped with other work for the war. So, the Air Force transferred the project over to Lockheed, who they knew from the earlier proposal had already messed about with jets. It didn't progress very quickly until the discovery of the ME-262 in the spring of 1943. Intelligence reports show that the Germans were working on this aircraft, and it would demonstrate significant superiority over current piston engine planes. They felt that they would need a jet answer to this, especially if the 262 showed up in large numbers, and the British were willing to help out with this. They had also been working on jets quite a bit, and were much more far along than we were in America, on par with German development. They sent over documents and blueprints, and the General of the Army Air Force, Henry H. Arnold, believed that an airframe developed to accept the British-made Halford H-1B Goblin jet engine would provide superior performance that could match the new German jets. As such, Lockheed was tasked with designing an aircraft based on their own experience with working on the L-133. And Lockheed knew going into this they should probably make something that was, um, reasonable. Not the L-133. Something that they could get out very quickly because that's exactly what the army was looking for. They wanted something right now, today, which was also very unreasonable, but the point is, they didn't have time to tinker about with something a little crazy. They needed to make something that could work right then and there. Concepts on the XP-80 started in May of 1943. They hadn't received the British turbojet at that point, but Lockheed did obtain its blueprint dimensions and simply developed the airframe around those dimensions so it would be able to accept the engine. The team consisted of 28 engineers, led by Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, they were pressed to develop a comparable jet to both British and German outings as quickly as possible. Kelly Johnson would wind up submitting a design proposal in mid-June, and promised that he could deliver a prototype ready for testing in just 150 days, which sounds insane, but he did it. The team, beginning June 26, 1943, produced the airframe 
ahead of schedule in just 143 days, and it was delivered to Moroc Army Airfield on November 16th. The whole project was top secret, like so top secret. There were 130 people in total working on the project in various capacities, but out of them, only five knew that they were developing a jet. And the British engineer who personally delivered the Hafford H1 engine was actually detained by the police because Lockheed officials couldn't vouch for him because it would violate the secrecy of the project. That British engineer had a rough go of it because, well, the engine he delivered also got destroyed immediately. By foreign object damage. When he dropped the engine off, he had warned them that the skin of the inlet ducts on their airframe was going to be too thin. But the American engineers ignored this advice. And when they powered the engine up to full throttle, both ducts collapsed, were sucked in, and shredded the engine. So that was, that was good. This, of course, delayed the first flight until a second engine could be received. And there was only one other in existence. The only reason this didn't set them back months is because de Havilland was kind enough to give them the only other engine they had, which they had intended for their prototype vampire. The inlet ducts were sufficiently modified and strengthened to avoid a repeat of the first tests, and the first prototype was nicknamed Lulubelle, which is just, just adorable. Her name was Lulubelle, guys. They also sometimes called her Green Hornet because of the paint scheme, but I prefer Lulu Belt because it's way cuter. She first flew on January 8th, 1944, with Lockheed test pilot Milo Burcham at the controls. Kelly Johnson said it was a magnificent demonstration and that our plane was a success. And in following test flights, the prototype eventually reached a top speed of 502 miles per hour making it the first turbojet-powered USAAF aircraft to exceed 500 miles per hour in level flight. But despite these early successes, developing the shooting star did not go smoothly in any way. Pilots transitioning from piston engine aircraft to jet found it unfamiliar. Jets did not behave in the same way, even down to just noise. When they flew at high speed, they were used to hearing a very loud reciprocating engine. But the shooting star didn't do this and they had to retrain themselves to rely on the airspeed indicator rather than just sound cues. The second prototype, which was called the XP-80A, was designed to test out the General Electric I-40 engine. Two such prototypes with this engine were tested, but things didn't go well with them. Milo Burcham, who had enjoyed flying Lulubel, found these new prototypes to be severely lacking in terms of power. The I-40s just weren't as good as the British-built H-1, and they were considered a bit disappointing, at least at first, though improvements would be made. There was also sufficient danger involved with testing these planes. As I said, pilots were not familiar with jets or the high speeds, and many accidents happened as a result of messing about with the shooting star. Bertram himself was killed on October 20th, 1944, in an accident while flying a YP-80A. Another accident happened on March 20th, 1945, though that time the pilot, Tony Levere, did escape. The top-scoring World War II USAAF ace, Major Richard Bong, was also killed on an acceptance flight of a production P-80 on August 6, 1945. He actually crashed for the same reason as Bircham, a main fuel pump failure. Virgin's death was a result of a failure to actually tell him about a newly installed emergency fuel pump backup system, which would have saved his life in his situation. But investigation of Bong's crash found that in his case, even though he had been told about it, he had forgotten to turn that pump on, which again would have prevented the accident. He had bailed out, but it was too close to the ground for his parachute to deploy. Bong's death was a significant blow to the program overall, and the USAAF and Lockheed wanted to prove the reliability of the airplane. Robert E. Thacker, from the Flight Test Division at Wright Field, was ordered to select three new pilots, get a hold of five P-80s from Lockheed, take them to Murak Army Air Base, and fly each of them for 500 hours to prove that these planes were in fact safe, and this was all just a string of bad luck. The three pilots that he got included Chuck Yeager, and they indeed put 500 hours on each airplane 
without any further incidents, showing that while the accidents had been tragic, it wasn't because the planes themselves were dangerous. The Shooting Star did begin to enter service in late 1944 before the end of World War II, but they never actually saw combat. There were a few stationed out in Italy, but delays in delivering the production aircraft meant that they would never see any action during the war. In truth, by the time they were ready, the war was basically over. The Mustangs were doing just fine, and even though the ME-262 did show up, they weren't in sufficient numbers to turn the tide of the war, and as such we just didn't need the Shooting Star, at least at the time. But they were still in service, and stayed that way even after the conflict. Several variants were messed about with, and on January 27, 1946, Colonel William H. Council flew one of them non-stop across the United States to make the first transcontinental jet flight. He completed this in 4 hours, 13 minutes, and 26 seconds, at an average speed of 484 miles per hour. He was aided by the upper-level westerly winds, a modified P-80B prototype, meant to be a racer and designated P-80R, was piloted by Colonel Albert Boyd to obtain a world air speed record of 623.73 miles per hour on June 19, 1947. When production began on the latest iteration, the P-80C, in 1948, the newly formed United States Air Force redesignated them as F-80C, and the Navy did mess about with them too. Utilizing them mostly as trainers, the Navy actually loved them as training aircraft, and wound up procuring 698 of the T-33 Shooting Stars, which was the training variant of the Shooting Star. More on those later, however. But where the Shooting Star finally saw combat was in the Korean War. They were among the first aircraft to be involved in jet versus jet action. The Air Force by this point was using the F-80C variant. They also utilized the RF-80 photo recon version. And they flew both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground sorties, claiming multiple victories against North Korean Yak-9s and IL-10s. But those were both piston-engine aircraft, so the F-80s had a significant advantage. But then, um, they ran into what could be defined as a problem. The Soviet MiG-15 was an entirely different situation for the Shooting Star. Yeah, they were both jets, but the MiG-15 had two words. Swept wings. The MiG-15s incorporated German research that had showed that the swept wings delayed the onset of compressibility problems and enabled speeds that were much closer to the speed of sound. The MiGs were just straight up faster, and that was a problem for Shooting Star pilots. On November 1st, 1950, a MiG-15 pilot, Lieutenant Semyon F. Komenich, became the first pilot in history to be credited with a jet versus jet aerial kill after he said he shot down an F-80. But, on the American side, they said the F-80 was taken down by Flack, not by him. One week later, on November 8th, an American pilot, Lieutenant Russell J. Brown, who was in an F-80, reported that he had shot down a MiG-15. The Soviets claimed that there were no MiGs lost that day, and that their pilot survived by pulling out of the dive at low altitude. Okay, look, guys, guys, I know it's the Cold War, but... But either one, or both of you, are lying to me, and I hate it. Please, I, I don't know what's happening here. Come on! Regardless of all of this, it was obvious that the MiG-15s were technically superior to the Shooting Stars. But that didn't mean the Shooting Stars were going to go down without a fight. They managed to take down at least six MiG-15s on their own, but they were quickly replaced by the more modern F-86 Sabres, which had been rushed into service in order to deal with the MiGs. The Shooting Stars were then relegated to only ground attack missions, advanced flight training duties, as well as air defense over in Japan. By the end of hostilities, the only Shooting Stars that were still in Korea were the photo reconnaissance variants. The type would be officially retired in the United States in 1959, but that was only the fighter variant. Because as I mentioned earlier, there was also the T-33, the Shooting Star Trainer. The main difference between them and the regular Shooting Stars was that they had an extended fuselage to allow room for a second seat and set of instruments for an instructor. 
These aircraft not only were produced in much larger numbers, but lasted way longer than their fighter variant forebears. Versions of this aircraft would be kept in use for decades and wouldn't be completely withdrawn in America until 1997. That is an insane longevity. Because, simply put, while the shooting stars didn't stay relevant for long, well, the one thing they did have was stability. Their straight wings allowed for a very stable jet platform, and that made them good for training. They were lower speed jets, too, so they were fantastic for getting a brand new pilot's feet wet when it came to controlling a jet aircraft. And 1997 was just for America. The Bolivian Air Force still used them as late as July of 2017. Other planes also spun off from shooting star development, including the F-94 Starfire. No, not that Starfire, this Starfire. But that aircraft's honestly its own story. In any event, the shooting star definitely made history, as the first operational jet fighter for America, and did a serviceable job despite being outclassed rather quickly. They have a special place in many a plane spotter's hearts, and there are a ton in preservation. I mean, so many. Seriously, there, there are a lot in preservation, including Lulubel, the very first XP-80. She's on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267 Orange Glass, Benjo Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Rare Videos, Lord Off 444, a person 723, Royal Hudson 2860, Icer for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds The Baxter, Caleb Cross White Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Dolinsky, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mark Holding, Dr. Racer 78, G Wiz, Mr. Terrell, Liam Wright, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, Battle 604, Hannah Bird, Railroad Preserver 2000, No, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.